Welcome to Pop Turnative, where we dive into topical discussions from the worlds of pop culture, social media, and sports. Here is your host, Peter Romoliotis, aka PD Beats. Hello and welcome to the Pop Turnative Podcast, the podcast and talk show where we have digital discussions from the worlds of TV, film, pop culture, social media, sports, everything really depending on the guests, we talk about it all. As always, I'm your host, Prima Lutis, and on social media, you know me as Peter Beats. My guest is a filmmaker. He makes movies, he acts in movies as well. You'll recognize him as Viper and Full House and Fuller House, but he's made a lot of really cool films. Um, we are with David Lipper. David, welcome to Pop Alternative, man. Yes, Pop Alternative. I'm here, finally. Absolutely. It's a lifelong dream, and it's happening. I like it. No, thank you for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. How has uh, how's quarantine life been for you? I mean, look, uh, as far as quarantine goes, uh, it's pretty good for me. Uh, I live in a beautiful house in, in Los Angeles. I got a pool in the backyard, my dogs. Uh, and I've been working my butt off this whole quarantine because by the grace of God, I finished filming my latest film called Linked right at the quarantine. And when I say right at the quarantine, it's literally like Gar- uh, Governor Newsom announced this was going into effect and people were walking off the set. That's that's how quick it was. So we really scrambled to get the last things we had to get. And um, I saw it coming. Uh, it's the first film, uh, first big film that I've directed. Uh, mm-hmm. So <laughs> you'd think it would have been a little easier for me. Um, but uh, I had the foresight to know this was coming. I saw what was going on in the news and I said, we better, we better cut the schedule. So I sat down with my first AD, who's a rock star. Her name is um, Elizabeth um, Blake Thomas, Mm -hmm. and she's also a director. Uh, So that helped. And uh, I said, how do we knock a week off? And she's like, we can do it. And I'm like, okay, how? And it was like Rain Man, like grabbing 25 sheets of paper and scribbling here and cutting this here and moving this here. And we cut a week off the schedule and I, and I finished on time and kind of having the last laugh now because they're lining up, you know, uh, distributors and sales agencies saying, we, we want your product. Uh, when's it done? And so what I've been able to do in the, in the lockdown is work remotely with my editors. Yeah. And, you know, the wonderful world we live in, like right now, the way we're talking. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking on Zoom calls every day. I was about to and, say editors um, must be really busy right now. No problem for them. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm getting like sub uh, clips uh, constantly. I'm going through the new cut. Then I'm making my notes. They go in. They send me the new sub clip. Um, and this has been all day, every day. For um, sure. And, uh, and we're almost done. You know, I've, I've, I delivered my first cut last week. Got some notes from the producers, my own notes, the editor's notes. And this is a process where you go back and forth and massage it. And I kind of look it over and I go, that whole scene is not working i need to shoot something no it's it's how do you shoot something in a quarantine so i call up a buddy who has a drone meet me at sunrise at this location and it feels like very uh undercover uh stuff but uh that's what we're living in it's like the streets are half empty and things are shut down and you know it's like we want to just feel like we're alive so The more I continue to work, the more I still feel I'm in Normalsville. Mm -hmm. Uh, And luckily, a lot of what's been going on has just gone right over my head. Because if I sat and watched CNN all day, I would literally go nuts. Um, And uh, the fact that I get to work all day Mm -hmm. has been a a godsend. And now I've got two films that I'm delivering probably in the next three to four weeks. This film and Reboot Camp, wonderful comedy with Ed Begley Jr., Ja Rule, David Koechner, um, and Pearson Foday, who Deadline just uh, put out a, a release saying he's starring off as a Kevin Hart in a big new comedy, a big studio pick called The Man from Toronto. Amazing. Canadian. Yeah, that's right. The Man <laughs> from Toronto. That's um, the title. That's awesome. Um, you wear many hats. People who follow you know that like you you, you got to wear many hats in this industry. So it's like kind of a two-part question for you. Um, part one is, you know, I call it like people like yourself, especially you, um, you're a storyteller in many regards because you act, you direct, you write, you do all of it. So 
when did you kind of decide you want to get into storytelling? And in your opinion for, you know, people in the film industry, how important is it to wear many hats, even though sometimes it's not going to be comfortable and glamorous for you to try new things? So when I started in this business um, and I moved uh, to L.A. in in July of 91, uh, I was just a kid and probably a little arrogant and overconfident. But in fairness, things happened quickly and studio deals and network deals and projects flying at me and pilots that didn't get picked up. But then Full House happened and it was a huge, huge show. Um, you know, back in those days, the ratings were gigantic. Yeah. Uh, and you were you were Viper. Viper. I was Viper. Um <laughs> And like big things would happen and the money was big, but then they'd go away, but another thing would come in. So things were constantly happening in motion that I didn't really think about creating my own content. I never even floated the idea of writing, directing, producing, um, you know, other than it's nice to have more control than you have as an actor where you're waiting for them to hire you. But so much activity was happening. I didn't really have the chance to, to even warrant those thoughts. But things changed. Yeah. The business changed. Um, filmmaking has changed. The fact that we have these things yeah. that people can film. And you know, like I shot all my establishing shots for my film. They've now been replaced with drone shots that were shot not yesterday. <laughs> um, and I would do this. Yeah. And I did them as placeholders until I could shoot them because I didn't have time to shoot them when we knocked off a week from my schedule. But um, they look amazing. And so the fact is you can get out there and do things. And so that's created a new way of thinking um, that these YouTubers have actually taken the lead on and said, let's take a camera and a light and we'll shoot videos. And they found ways to monetize this. I know some YouTubers that make quite a bit of money. Um, I mean, millions when I say quite a bit of money, mm-hmm. more than I'm making for God's sakes. And I've done over 60 movies and um, and they you know, it's a self-promotion game. It's a do it yourself game. And so that all that's already, I think, a, a normal way of thinking for for our new uh, generation, for for today's kids who can think, well, I can be an Instagram model or I can be a TikToker. Yeah. And um, so. What's amazing about all this is I've been watching all this happening and I found the script by two Canadian boys, Duncan Forster, uh, being one of them who's here in LA and, um, and his partner is still, uh, in Canada, but Duncan and I met at a, at a screening and we hit it off and, you know, he had this script that's been collecting dust for God knows how long. And, um, and a friend of mine had it and I, th- it was talking about, it was like a scream movie where these kids were people, the killer knew where people were because of their social media, Yeah. but they were referencing like MySpace. That's how old this thing goes. So I grabbed the script and I kind of took a pen and went like this and, and I said, what's happening now? TikTok, Instagram, uh, Snapchat. Um, those are the big three. And of course, Facebook is still in there. And I said, now we got to add zoom and this whole feeling of group chatting. And what if I put that all into one app and I make this super current. And now if I tell it as a morality tale of what, what is killing our youth of today? What is the damage of a society growing up in? I can have everything I want. If I just have more likes and more followers. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter what I need to do to get them. If I have to wear a string bikini, if you're 16, 17, and God knows who's looking at that, whatever it takes, however crazy the video has to be, what if people start dying on video? What if we start seeing videos of a screwdriver through the, through the head? Mm. And it's like, is it real? Is it not real? And if you saw the movie, I don't know if I can swear on this channel, but I'll, I won't. Don't blank with cats right yeah um, where this yeah where the guy kills a cat right because he wants more likes and follows he wants that attention so this kind of answers that question of how far are these kids willing to go and i and i cast and by the way uh you know once i started putting all this together the the writers were like you need to direct this thing 
and that planted the seed of yeah i can direct this and you net did you did direct you did, did you ever direct before that never directed before this but god knows how many times i have sat down with directors and gone through their films with them uh and not only in pre-production where i know everything it takes to set up your shot list and 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 go from the prep side all the way to post where i'm with them through the color correction and the sound mix so i know every aspect from producing uh already that um this was a natural progression and i thought you know what i can direct this movie and i think i will Absolutely. And that was all I needed to do to put it in my head. And that was like, you know, January. Yeah. And by March, we were shooting. Amazing. Um, and then it was a matter of cast. Yeah. And I happened to have just shot the, I shot, maybe this happened in late fall. I shot the series finale of Fuller House. Um, they brought my character Viper back for the end of the, the new show, Fuller yep. House. And bumped into a bunch of these new kids that have a million, a million and a half, two million, twenty million. Followers. Isaac Presley, Isaac Presley being one of them, and his girl and um, Landry Bender. But Isaac's girlfriend, yeah, is uh, is Mackenzie Ziegler. Yeah, it was got thirteen, thirteen million. million. It's nuts. Yeah, right. I was kids like fifth out of sixteen. You know, so um, so I was talking to her. I was talking to Isaac, and I thought, you know, I'll grab Isaac. I'll grab her started you know putting this all together in my head real influencers yep. playing these hot kid influencers that everybody wants to be mm -hmm. and that are part of this group that everyone wants to be in and um mackenzie then then you get into the semantics of shooting a movie if she's under 18 if she's 16 for sure she's and not emancipated you got to have a tutor you got to do limited yeah. hours so you, all the crap we went through in full house it's like, oh God, I can't, I can't do this on a low budget independent film. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll blow my brains out. So that was out. Then Isaac was out. Then, um, then Jessica Belkin, who I had worked with on two other films, she played my daughter in last year's Lifetime movie, um, Sleeping with My Student. Mm -hmm. Great title. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, then she played uh, in my last film, Reboot Camp. Um, uh, I got her in that film. So. Uh, so I called Jessica, sent her the script. She's like, I love this. I got to play Tabitha. You got to let me play Tabitha. And I said, done. You know, and she's so gorgeous. She's up to like a million and a half followers on TikTok. So does that happen and a lot then? When like you send your scripts out and then people are just like, I want to make this or I want to be in this. Like, does that happen more than people think? And it's like it, it either that, that reaction or not for me. You know, yeah. I had both. I went, to, I went to Stamos to play the psychiatrist. And I said, Stamos, I need, I need you to do this. And he's like, dude, I'm on another show. And I'm like, I know, but it's one day. I'll shoot you out in a day. And he's like, all right, let me read the script. And then he's like, I just played a psychiatrist on this Netflix show, and uh, I, I just don't want to do it again. I was yeah. like, no. Okay. He's like, why, no. <laughs> he, goes, why don't you, he goes, why don't you ask Saget? And I'm like, no, this is not, this is not the Saget. This is like a handsome, charming psychiatrist this is not sad how important is, is it though to establish kind of relationships though in, in the industry as well sometimes that might be difficult I can't, do, I can't do can't do what i do if i'm not me look i pulled off uh on a budget i won't tell you what the budget was i mean it, it wasn't nothing but it was uh it was a sag film but in the very low budget area of sag and um you know, it's impossible to cast what I, the, first of all, look at the names I got in Reboot Camp, okay? And I mm -hmm. basically cast them almost the entire film. David Koechner, uh, uh, Pearson, who I already mentioned now yep. is starring opposite uh, Kevin Hart in a huge- Ed reality. Begley Jr. Ed Begley Jr., Eric Roberts, uh, and Lindsay Shaw, the one of the stars of Pretty Little Liars. Yep. I mean, and that that goes on and on and on that that cast. There's a cast of like 50 people. It's insane. For sure. And then for linked, Jessica Belkin, um, American Horror Stories, and a bunch of oh yeah, Chaz Bono by the way is also yep. in uh, Reboot Camp, uh, who was just on Larry David's show, um, which is, he, did a, he did a really funny bit on that. So I, and the funny thing is the people I have on the comedy are comedy people. Yeah, they're known for for comedy. Eric Roberts, by the way, for all the flack he may be getting, you know, from doing too many movies and gone downhill and whatever, you know, 
And it's a shame because he's a brilliant actor who was nominated for two Oscars. But um, he's hysterical playing himself um, because the whole premise of Reboot Camp is these people are all coming to learn from the guru on how to better their lives. And I'm totally scamming the whole thing. I have no idea what I'm doing. I put on a fake character and just kind of walk is in. This, is this out yet? Like Can you. people see this? Almost, almost, okay. almost, almost. Uh, we're in the color correction phase right now. Okay. And the, and the sound mix. So I would say that's going to be done in about three, three weeks. Then it has to go through sales and quality control and all that stuff. Probably in six weeks, it could be out. Amazing. Um, and linked also could be out in six weeks. For I mean, sure. That's how fast I'm moving. I, yeah. I did want to ask you because I do admire your work specifically in the genre of the horror genre because that's one of my favorite yeah. genres of film. So I know like I like we're talking comedy, reboot camp, but like I definitely I wanted to squeeze this in. You know what yeah. I mean? Like Let's I was excited. It. So what I love about horror in the last couple of years is you don't I talk, I talked to Lynn Shea from Insidious and a bunch of other incredible movie. movies. Yeah, I, I talked yeah. to her about this and she agreed. Yeah. It's not all about the gore and the cheap jump scares right now. The horror that scares me is the movie where it's basically like the genre is like the dinner party gone wrong. People show up to a party. There's a character there. He's acting very weird and people are like, okay, he's weird. What's going on with this? He's act. He's making me feel uncomfortable. That type of stuff. It's not like the direct, like, oh my God, like a jump scare or, oh my God, it's gore or like a killer. That's the stuff. It's like the mental game a little bit. So what do you kind of think about the genre of horror? Do you agree with me a little bit that like there's kind of new methods and new ways to scare people these days, David? Okay, so so uh, there's a few parts to that question. I'm excited. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm excited one, to hear this because I mean, this is the part of the time, interview I was excited to talk this about. Is, this is uh, <laughs> definitely one of my, you know, comedy and horror, my two genres. Exactly. Um, Go so, for it. Um, so first off, let's start with The Unwilling. Okay, yep. The Unwilling is a is a film that I wrote uh, and starred in and yep. uh, and produced, and that is on Amazon now, and uh, it's already up to almost five million views on a YouTube channel. Um, and that came out a couple years ago, and uh, and it's done quite well. So, The Unwilling started where you know a friend of mine who's a former Oscar nominated uh, director, Jonathan Keep, said, "I want to do a film with you. Can we?" do something that takes place in a house, figure it out. <laughs> I said, okay. okay. Um, I liked the idea of be careful what you open. You have to start with a theme, okay? Anything you write as young filmmakers, as writers, as directors, has to come from what's the lesson? What is the moral of the story? If I don't come from that place, then I'm just blah, okay? If I'm coming from the place of, I want you walking out of the theater or out of your bedroom, with the notion of, I learned something here about myself, and that may invoke change. And that may sound hokey on a horror movie, but that is exactly what a horror movie is. To me, a horror movie is a morality tale, a cautionary tale. So in The Unwilling, it answered the question, be careful what you open. Um, the box that mysteriously arrives uh, where these people are all congregated at this house presents each character with the thing that they most want. Now, I was very much into the whole seven deadly sins and the archetypes of characters that you have the greedy one, you have the vain one, you have the lustful one, um, and each character kind of uh, expressing those traits. And so when the box opens a drawer, it's a brick of gold, or it's drugs, you know, for the gluttonous drug addict, or, um, or it's a mirror for the vain one. And once they take that object, they get possessed. That's kind of the premise uh, of the unwilling. And that's how the demon gets in. And what's a demon? What is the devil? What is evil? Um, is the giving over your power to these, what we call the seven deadly sins, but really what they are is like urges, inclinations, desires, um, things that take away from us being good spiritual people. and. And the lesson kind of being learned is not to give in to those things. It's, you know, here's, the th here's my take on, on what they call the deadly sins. Um, there's value in everything, okay? There's value in lust. We have to procreate. There's value in fear, right? That tells me don't stand too close to the cliff. You may fall off. Step back. There's value in um, vanity. Ask to the gym 
work out, be healthier, look better. But when those things take over, when they become overpowering, that's when we lose ourselves. And so I think this is, this is the mythology of how these things have come, come to, to pass, is that you know, the way the devil gets in, the way the demon gets in, are through these defects of character, so to speak. And that's what I wanted to the unwilling. And I wanted the hero, David, uh, of the film to kind of figure out his own path through this and make a final sacrifice at the end of the movie without giving too much away. And that's kind of how it ends up as how it does if you get to watch it. With um, Linked, again, I said, you know, if I'm going to do another uh, horror film like this, it's got to have a, a major moral for me. It has to be life changing. It has to be something where you finish watching the film and you go, I want to make a change. And that's where I was excited about the prospect of taking social media, how this is affecting us, probably vanity being the big trigger here, where we're so self-obsessed. There's no longer communication like you and I are talking. Yeah. There's no longer, hey, how are you? Like, I genuinely want to connect with you and have a conversation. There's yeah. simply, let me edit and re-edit and re-edit on this thing until I present an image that gets me more people liking me, more people following me. And what are the dangers of that? And I think the dangers are quite large. And what's interesting is in this quarantine, this has blown exponentially because we don't have a choice. So all we can do is sit there on the bloody phones and computers and social media has taken off. Um, and girls are taking all kinds of pictures all day long of, of themselves. Jessica Belkin, who's in my film, like I said, is now up to a million and a half followers, and she's nonstop with the videos on the TikTok and all these things, right? So that's who these characters are. And through the eyes of our hero, our heroine, uh, Julie, we're going to go on a journey and, and discovery and see where she ends up. And she's going to learn herself that there's probably a better way to live way we're living right now that, that's what we're about amazing well no like i because i i might or might not be writing some horror films myself you know what i mean it's a genre that i'm really excited for uh for you know what i mean and it's it's amazing but uh david thank you so much for coming on the show man no no problem and just before i lose you i just wanted to the part of your question which is where do the scares go and where does this happen yeah that's structural stuff okay that you can get it in from any good book that delineates structure open with the big scare um get into the hero's beginning of her story or his story um get a scare by page 20 get a scare by page 40 get a scare by you know what i'm saying that's just follow the textbook um focus on the story focus on the moral the theme don't worry about the rest that's just cookie cutter absolutely it's uh it's amazing where can people follow you on social media and where can they watch some of your films and what should they Thinking be looking out social for media all right so uh like i said the unwillings on amazon and youtube you can find it but you have ads on youtube so if you have amazon prime free go see it the unwilling uh you can follow me on instagram at david lipper you can follow me uh, uh on twitter i think it's at lip dude uh, you can follow me also. Uh, there's a, a Facebook page, a uh, fan page that you can go to. And um, what am I missing? What do I got? Instagram. Uh, I think that's, you know, oh, TikTok, whatever. TikTok, D Lipper, one, two, three, four, or something. Uh, I don't have much going on in the TikTok. That's more for the kids. Amazing. And once, uh, I, once I learn these moves a little better, I can join the TikTok. Generation. Incredible. Well, thank you for coming on the talk about the industry and, and some of your films, man. That's awesome. And uh, I hope to chat with you again soon, man. Anytime. Good well, chatting, brother. Of course. Well, this has been Pop Turner of YouTube.com slash Pop Turner for previous episodes. And until next time, this is David Lipper and Petey Beats signing off. Thank you for tuning in to Pop Turnative. Make sure to check out our past episodes of Pop Turnative on YouTube. Be sure to like Popternative on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. This has been an Autograph Communications production.